I thought ministering will be joining in just a moment. Thank you. Well, in the meantime, I'll uh, begin some introductions and housekeeping items. So again, good evening and thank you for joining us for our third virtual town hall. I am Shikiba Shayani, the CEO at the Guelph Chamber of Commerce, and I welcome you this evening. As more updates and announcements continue to come out, we want to ensure that our members stay engaged with our government officials through town hall meetings like this one this evening. I would like to thank Minister Mary Ng and Guelph's Member of Parliament, Lloyd Longfield, and their teams for joining us today and addressing our members' questions and pressing concerns. As you all know, Minister Ng was first elected the Member of Parliament for Markham Thornhill in 2017. After being successfully re-elected in 2019, she became Canada's Minister of Small Business, Export Promotion, and International Trade. And we're so pleased she could join us this evening. We will spend the first half an hour asking Minister Ng questions that reflect the concerns we've heard from you, our members. Afterwards, we will continue a Q&A period with MP Longfield. If anyone would like to ask a question to MP Longfield, please type it in the Q&A area found at the bottom of your screen. If you see a question that you like, please upvote it by clicking the thumbs up instead of posing the same question. We will be recording this town hall and we will post it to our YouTube page tomorrow morning. Now to begin, first I'd like to pass the mic to our MP, Lloyd Longfield, and then to Minister Mary Ng to share some opening remarks. Lloyd, to you. Great, thanks Shakiba, and always good to be at a chamber event, even if it's a virtual one, you still bring the community together, so we really appreciate that. It has been a time. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, the anxiety over the medical concerns that we all have for ourselves and our families, but also what's going to happen on the other side with the economy and how quickly we can bounce back, what areas are going to need attention, and how we can work together to try and bring us to a safe re-entry into the economy to make sure that employees are safe, and that businesses are able to, to operate in a way that um, they get up to speed at the same time as keeping the people working, uh, working in the business uh, safe. And so we're, we have programs that we've been working on from the federal government, of course, and then also working with the provincial government uh, and the Department of Labor to uh, have uh, work sites checked out for, for uh, the measures that they're taking and also to a certain degree sharing expenses wherever that's possible with the provincial government and uh, with the municipal government. So Mike Mike and Cam and I have been working closely together throughout all this. I see Minister Ng is with us on, on the screen now too. So good to see you here, Mary. We, we sat on Indu committee together uh, when she was first elected and um, I'm following, I'm sitting on Indu committee right now virtually and following the proceedings uh, as we're waiting to get started. Um, because the industry committee for canada is looking at our strategy and the impact on business small and large business in canada and uh, tonight they're looking at the uh, broadband in the rural areas and what we can do to support broadband development which has been a focus of our government as well but i'm here to listen and uh, to take every minute we have that we can use with minister Ng being with us in and so good to have you in Guelph, even virtually. <laughs> we'll have to see how we can do this more in the future. I know. This is great. Hi there. Hi. 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 Nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I know how busy your schedule is. Uh, we just gave some opening remarks <laughs> and set the stage, gave some housekeeping. And uh, we'd like to pass it over to you, Minister, for some welcoming remarks. Well, thank you so much, uh, Lloyd. It's really great to see you and to be with you. And um, and even though we're not there in person, uh, because you know these days we're all doing our part to flatten the curve and we're all uh, staying at home, it really is wonderful to be in Guelph virtually. So uh, so it's great. And uh, and Shakiba, thank you so much. Uh, you and your team at the you know at the Guelph Chamber for everything that you're doing and you know, for convening this and bringing, you know, bringing chamber members together um, for this really incredible conversation that, uh, that I'm looking forward to having. And it's, it's, it's wonderful because, you know, here's what, um, here's what I know to be uh, true. I mean, uh, the chamber and your members have shown how, um, you know, diversity of talent and thought um, 
you know, has, draw, has driven innovation uh, right there in Guelph and in the region. You're building, you know, strong and resilient uh, local community. You're creating, you know, the, the small businesses and indeed all businesses in the Guelph area are creating great uh, jobs for Canadians. And I really just appreciate the values that, uh, you know, that the chamber, um, you know, um, where it guides you. I mean, it guides you, um, you know, the values of excellence, of diversity, of inclusion, partnership, integrity. And uh, so thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, and quite candidly, um, it's needed now more than ever. So, uh, so, so thank you. And uh, from the very beginning of, uh, you know, of this crisis, we had made a commitment, uh, you know, as a government and certainly myself uh, to always listen to businesses and to keep a very ear to the ground to all our businesses across the country and working with my colleagues like Lloyd so that we are listening to businesses and the programs that you're seeing and the measures that that you're seeing uh, from the government is very much in response to what we heard directly from businesses. I want to thank everyone um, because um, all of us have been asked to do extraordinary things as Canadians to flatten this curve. We are staying home. Um, many are at home looking after their, you know, their 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 family. Uh, that includes, uh, you know, caregiving for uh, for those who are elderly. And everyone's doing their part to flatten the curve, and it has absolutely had an effect on our Canadian businesses. You're temporarily shutting your doors, or you're significantly scaling back your operations. And I just want to assure you that I really appreciate, um, you know, the two-way dialogue that we've had consistently with businesses. And if you take nothing away from this call, know that um, know that uh, we are here to work with you. And, uh, and we will continue to do that work to make sure that you are supported during this difficult period. And, um, and that, uh, that through working together, we will come out of this um, also together and, uh, and, and, and strongly. Uh, one of the things that we heard from businesses, and you're seeing this in the measures that we have put out, uh, right from the very beginning, businesses we're starting to see loss of revenue because of either shutting down or scaling back their operations. So they experienced significant, um, you know, they've experienced revenue losses. And for those businesses, they were really in a tough position because they were uh, needing to make decisions about their people. And it's their people that drives their businesses. It's the heart and soul. Um, you know, we often say this about our, our own teams, and that is absolutely true of businesses who said that they just need help to pay for their employees during this difficult period. So that's why we introduced a 75% wage subsidy uh, for those, um, you know, for businesses. Um, it backdates till March. So it's March, April, and May. The portal, of course, is, uh, is, is, is open and, and businesses have already been applying. Well over 100,000 businesses have applied. And, uh, and, and in fact, I think uh, deposits as early as today are starting to be made by the Canada Revenue Agency into the accounts of businesses. So we are seeing uh, businesses take this up and, uh, and, you know, so that they can keep their teams together. We know that employers and employees, if they are able to stay together during this difficult time, that that road to recovery, it just means that that road to recovery, when it's safe to do so, they're better equipped to doing it because they've got their teams together. Uh, the other thing we heard from businesses is how important it is to keep costs low during this period so that they can actually have as much flexibility as possible. So in this right away, we um, deferred payments for the GST and PST and customs duties. And um, just to give you sort of an order of magnitude of how this will help, it's gonna help about three, a little over 3 million businesses and, uh, and entrepreneurs. And to give you the size of what this means, it's about equivalent to a $30 billion interest-free loan to businesses, to those 3.2 million businesses across the country, just from deferring the GST, PST, sorry, GST, HST, and uh, customs duties. And then of course, businesses have bills to pay. You have operating costs. And, uh, and for the smallest of businesses, making sure that you are able to have operating funds to bridge through this period, uh, this is why we introduced the $40,000 uh, interest-free loan. 
also called the, the acronym is SIBA, or the Canada Emergency Business Account. So it's $40,000, $10,000 of that is forgivable if you're able to pay it back by the end of 2022. And to date, um, over half a million businesses, so it's about 550,000 businesses have already been approved. So we know that this loan is getting out to businesses um, who are, you know, who need it and who are, who are, who are using this to pay for those uh, operating expenses that are really, you know, that are really important. And, you know, and you need, and you need that operating, uh, you know, that operating capital over this period of time to weather through this uh, difficult period. And, um, and Guelph in particular, um, you're innovative. You've got this great hub there. You have businesses that are high growth, that are innovative. Um, you also have uh, young entrepreneurs. And we know that some of the programs I just described may not necessarily have worked for some of those high growth businesses or indeed our young entrepreneurs. So that's why we invested for the high growth companies into the industrial research assistance program to help those high growth businesses access the support that they need and then into Futurepreneur uh, so that Futurepreneur can continue to support and assist those businesses that are led by young entrepreneurs. And then maybe the final thing I'll talk about in terms of supports is uh, commercial rent assistance. We've learned uh, loud and clear, we continue to hear the important support that is needed for businesses that bear that expense in commercial rent every month. And this is where we introduce the um, Canadian Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program. Um, it will be operational somewhere around sort of the middle of May. And this is uh, a 75% assistance to those businesses where their rent is under $50,000 a month. But it's also intended to help those that are really the hardest hit. You've had to close your doors. You've had to scale back uh, your businesses so significantly. You are seeing, you know, a 70% 70, 70 loss in, uh, you know, in revenue. So we want to make sure that those that are the hardest hit get the support through, um, through the rent assistance. So a range of measures that we hope are comprehensive. And then... Uh, we continue to listen to uh, to businesses so that we can keep doing the work that is necessary to support you through this period, and um, and Guelph being um, being a strong agricultural producer uh, with a vibrant uh, you know agribusiness uh, and agricultural sector. Um, I'm also minister of international trade, so it's really important that uh, that I continue to the, do the work as I have been to ensure that our supply chains uh, remain open, particularly for agricultural products, so that not only are we feeding Canada, but that we're you know that we're we're ensuring that uh, that the world. Um, now, the critical supply chain for food uh, is not disrupted during this uh, during COVID-19, and um, and this is uh, this is work that I continue to do, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, you know, by working with my G20 counterparts, so G20 trade ministers, working with uh, the World Trade Organization to ensure that they continue to have the role that they do in ensuring a rules-based international global uh, supply chain uh, continues, uh, working with organizations like APEC, um, so that we are signing on to those joint commitments um, with other countries to ensure that global supply chain remains open. This is why we see food continuing to be in our grocery stores. This is why we see the continuing production of critical medical supplies, critical drugs that uh, you know that Canada is a producer of, but relies on you know on global value chains and supply chains. So making sure that that work uh, continues and that we are doing that, and that Canada continues to lead the efforts, um, you know, with the WTO to to ensure that that multilateral rules based system uh, is something that we all continue to um, you know to defend and to, uh, to to work towards making sure that the, that that uh, that um, uh, we keep trade um, open and uh, and to make sure that uh, we have um, that our people have the you know have access to the programs that I just talked about and to um, you know to have the tools that we're going to need as we all work together uh, you know going forward as we all you know in in the restart which which will which will come uh, but it will come in a measured way 
that does not uh, see us losing the progress that we've made in flattening the curve and that we're going to do it in a coordinated fashion um, and in a measured fashion, uh, taking advice from public health that's evidence-based and, uh, and, and doing this carefully so that, uh, so that we're looking after people, but that we're also ensuring that our businesses uh, begin to sort of get on that footing uh, as they need to, as they plan towards a, you know, a restart. So uh, the, the common theme always is that we are going to listen and we're going to do this together. And um, we are in a global pandemic and this has been difficult, but we are going to get through it and we're going to get through it together. So with that, I will stop and happy to have a, a conversation. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate you providing that overview and you hit on uh, quite a few subject areas uh, that are pertinent that we hope to dive into uh, a little bit deeper with you. So um, to set the stage, if you don't mind, I do want to make a, a couple quick remarks um, just based on our lens as we've engaged with our members. So obviously, like you mentioned, and as you know, the pandemic has been an extraordinary time in which we have seen existing economic, social and environmental issues significantly challenged. The crisis has shown us that our strength and resilience as communities and economies are fragile. So as we move forward to a post-pandemic new normal, governments, community and business leaders and citizens across the country do need to adapt, like you said, to new challenges in a new and creative way. So our conversations with businesses um, in our community, as well as other leaders in Guelph, have been instructive in those efforts. The most common areas of concerns we've uh, received a lot of feedback include government programs, so related to some of the design, engagement, and efficacy of the ones you spoke of. We've heard of the medium and long-term impacts of the crisis on businesses, so thinking about economic decline, uh, the rise of reactionary political movements, sometimes the worsening of marginalized or antagonistic voices. But we've also heard lots about the desire to help so notwithstanding the anxieties and frustrations and evolving challenges, businesses in our community want to help and they are helping. And we need to make sure that we harness that dynamic creativity and drive and integrate those resources into the planning and execution of our response to the pandemic. So with that context in mind and mindful of your time, Minister, we'll jump into our handful of questions here. So first, like you mentioned, Guelph, as you know, has a long and successful affiliation with Canada's agri-food sector. Your mandate as minister includes finding ways to enhance those exports. Agri-food has emerged as a core and critical sector during the pandemic and will be core strength as we rebuild. I'm curious if you've thought about uh, looking at reforming investment or other policy tools to make the sector more resilient and better positioned for global success. Yeah, that's a very, very good question. And, um, and uh, there's no question that um, making sure that the agri-food and uh, the agriculture sector is, uh, you know, continues to contribute in such a valuable way as they always have is something that I've been working with my colleague, the agriculture minister, Minister Bebo, about. In fact, uh, just uh, earlier today, I had, um, I spoke to the board members of CAFTA to talk about how the government can support the agriculture and agri-food uh, sector and certainly exporters. Um, and, um, and you heard this a little bit in my, um, in my introduction, but, um, but trade is really important to the sector because so much of what we produce is destined to markets around the world. So it's really important that we um, continue to uh, work with organizations like the World Trade Organization um, on, uh, on, on preserving the multilateral rules-based system, um, making sure that Canada continues sort of to lead the efforts, um, um, continue to lead the efforts at making sure that those supply chains stay open and, um, and more directly to, you know, to the agricultural sector or agri-foods um, you know, my colleague um, and the prime minister, my, col my, my, my colleague minister, as well as the prime minister, just earlier in the week announced a $252 million direct funding support to, um, you know, to agricultural programs that support farmers, food businesses, and food processors. And, um, and without getting into sort of the, the, the many sort of supports um, into, you know, for the sector, know that it is absolutely important. It is absolutely important that we work together so that we continue on the trade side to ensure that those markets are are there for our for our 
exporters to get their products into those markets and to make sure domestically we are providing the supports necessary to weather through this difficult period so that beyond it, we are indeed going to uh, you know, support the continued growth uh, and vibrancy of the sector. Great, I appreciate that. Now I'm wondering, like you mentioned with the pandemic in mind, um, and we've noticed of course that countries around the world are more insular and, and fearful of relying on imports from abroad. Um, as you are responsible for the export promotion and international trade, how do you plan to encourage then foreign markets to purchase Canadian exports? Well, I think the uh, the work that uh, you know, I, I think during this uh, during the pandemic, I probably have released. I think I've lost count now, but probably you know four, five, six, even sort of statements, uh, you know, together with other countries that uh, really stand up the importance of international trade and that trade and investment uh, globally continues to be important uh, for our many for our many many industries. And uh, while during this time, uh, some countries have, uh, you know, have uh, put up sort of uh, protectionist measures, um, we're ensuring that, uh, you know, we continue to support uh, the need for, you know, for transparency and the need for these protectionist measures to come down as quickly, you know, as quickly as possible as we are coming, as we come out of, you know, COVID-19. So whether it is issuing a joint statement with G20 ministers to, um, to reiterate the commitment of all of our countries to open supply chains, particularly for agriculture, for critical medical supplies and equipment, essential goods, services and personnel, um, you know, to working with, um, you know, with the APEC countries issuing a similar statement, working with countries like, you know, in, in, uh, in the Asia Pacific, like Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore. Um, so just a range of, you know, just a range of continued dialogue to make sure that the importance of the openness of trade um, is preserved during this period and that we continue to work towards those rules-based uh, multi you know multilateral international systems so that uh, so that we continue to be able to move those markets around the world is going to continue to be very important and we in Canada will continue to take a leadership role. That's great thank you. So um, as we think about businesses who are now thinking about preparing to reopen and bring their employees back to work, I'm wondering what if there are any plans in place to support or mitigate the additional costs which will be incurred to meet those public health recommendations you mentioned and ensure the safety of both employees and their customers and clients. Yeah, that's a very, very good question. And, you know, the approach we're going to take is the same approach we've taken all, always, which is to work with businesses, to work with, um, you know, our provincial and territorial partners in this. I think the, um, you know, the, the, the collaboration that has taken place needs to continue. And, and, uh, and because, you know, we are still, um, you know, we still have to make sure that we don't lose progress on, uh, you know, on that that's been made to flatten the curve. And, um, and this is why the province, the provinces and territories, together with the Prime Minister, uh, the federal government, uh, agreed on a set of guiding principles in the reopening and uh, in the restart of, uh, you know, of businesses and, and respective economies uh, kind of throughout the country. COVID-19 has been experienced differently uh, in different parts of the country. So it's expected that you're going to see um, some activity that will be different uh, in different parts of the country. But I think everyone agrees that the need for coordination, the need to uh, adhere to, you know, evidence, evidence based, health evidence based, uh, our public health officials is going to be really important as we step through this together. And just as we have been listening to businesses all the way along, so that the measures that you are seeing now has been in direct response to businesses and really a two-way exchange uh, with businesses, we're gonna do that as well now into this next period. And I wanna sort of give a shout out to the National Chamber uh, we have partnered with the National Chamber, and of course that includes, uh, you know, that includes all the local chambers as well, which is through the, uh, and, and created together 
the Canadian Business Resilience Network. So through there, um, the federal government and the National Chamber is working together to make sure that the right information is getting out to businesses, that they're able to navigate the range of supports at the federal at the federal level, but also at the other orders, at the other levels of government, making sure that we have that voice uh, directly from all of, you know, from you, so that, uh, so that the needs that you're going to articulate around, around uh, the support you're going to need in this restart, that we actually have a way to, you know, in which we're talking together. So that's really excellent that we have the Business Resilience Network. And I would just encourage us to continue to work through there so that we can um, so that we can work together in, 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 in making sure we get the supports to you that you need. Thank you. So speaking of those supports and those relief programs, of course, um, you know, including like you uh, mentioned in your introduction, the uh, Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program or the uh, loan program or the wage subsidy, they've been excellent programs for many businesses, but unfortunately not for many others as well. So for example, with the commercial rent, um, the eligibility criteria uh, where landlords without mortgages are unable to participate or perhaps tenants who have had to cease their operations but have not seen an exact 70% decrease are unable to participate and take advantage of that. I'm curious, and many of our members of course too, are there any plans to relax eligibility criteria in this case specifically to the rent assistance because it's so pressing as months go by, but also generally to the criteria that is often connected to the, the funding relief programs? Well, um, that's a very good question. And, um, and here's how we have uh, worked throughout this. And, um, and, and, and I know that this will continue, which is working together with our businesses and listening. I know that, uh, you know, Lloyd and I often will exchange emails, um, you know, about the many, many, um, you know, the feedback that he is getting directly from businesses, uh, you know, in Guelph. And uh, that's been enormously helpful. And I think what you've seen us do as well is we've adapted as we've been hearing, uh, you know, those concerns and the issues that have been raised. Now, with respect to landlords, who don't have mortgages. Um, I just want to clarify that because it's, uh, the, the, the commercial relief program is eligible for all property owners. I mean, even if they have sort of different forms of uh, leverage, which I think that means sort of, you know, different than, you know, if, if you're not, uh, if, if you're not necessarily a mortgage holder. Um, so there is, there is eligibility there. And, and we are going to get more details out, um, you know, with respect to the rent relief program sort of very shortly. And you'll see that we, you know, that, um, that we've been trying to make sure that our programs are easy to access, that they aren't burdensome for you to take advantage of. And I think that the response we've been getting back, whether it's the loans going directly to your financial institutions or the Canada Emergency Response Benefit or the wage subsidy, it's been done with sort of, you know, we're, we're trying to make it as easy as possible in this case for landlords to be able to take, you know, to, 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 uh, to take advantage of it. The design of it was really intended to help the small business owner with 75%, but also help that landlord who also will get 50% of, you know, of, of it uh, back in forgivable, you know, their loans are going to be forgivable. I know that landlords also want their spaces, uh, you know, they, they want their, they, they want to be paid. Um, they don't want their spaces to be empty. Um, so it really was designed so that, uh, so that it really does work for the landlord who often are also business owners themselves. Um, but certainly for the small business tenant who really does need this support. Um, but, you know, to answer your question, we're always listening and, uh, and we're going to, you know, we're going to do our very best to make sure that we are supporting, you know, supporting our businesses and our entrepreneurs across the country. I apologize for that very long answer. Uh, I should shorten that up, but, uh, mm -hmm. but I wanted to kind of get that in there. No, I appreciate the commentary. And of course, um, actually our, uh, Last question as we wrap up, I know you're, you're short on time this evening, um, is really, Minister, to, if there is one takeaway we'd like to leave with you is that we do believe, uh, like you've said, that the solution is different and unusual or unsuspecting partnerships and that agile leadership is required for us on both sides to build trust between government and businesses. Um, you know, restrictive eligibility requirements for relief programs and incremental rollouts 
have caused a lot of frustration. And so, um, you know, I, I know you've heard that a lot and that uh, I know Lloyd's heard that a lot and that continues to move up the change. Um, I'm wondering, do you have a plan in mind to engage and continue to engage a, a broader uh, group of businesses uh, in the future development and implementation of post-COVID policies and programs. Curious, what have you learned from your from the engagement you've done now, and how can we do that better going forward? Well, I think that uh, the engagement um, uh, we just had to stand up the engagement so quickly, and we needed to get supports out so quickly in response to COVID nineteen. We needed to make sure that uh, Canadians had, you know, had the necessities in order to do what uh, what was very difficult, which is, you know, stay at home, uh, close your business, scale back. I mean, so we need to make sure that it, it, it went out sort of very, very quickly. But my department, for example, has, um, you know, they talked to over a thousand businesses, including associations that represent businesses uh, every single day. And they will continue to do that. Um, the partnership with the Canadian Chamber in the Business Resilience Network is, you know, is, is uh, one of those uh, you know elements that we that we put together in the course of COVID nineteen, and listen, I mean, if there are you know if if there are suggestions or ways in which you think we could engage, uh, you know, get engaged better or differently, then let us know. Um, I don't think that uh, you know we we want to hear uh, where where it may not be working as well. So give us those solutions and, uh, and, and we'll absolutely take them in. This really is about listening to one another and making sure that we can you know, adapt as, as best as we can. And, uh, and, and, and I know that, uh, that for businesses, certainty, predictability, the ability to plan is absolutely key. And we, we understand that, but I think everyone will also agree that this has been unprecedented. Um, this is a global pandemic. It is a crisis that we uh, that that uh, that is hit Canada and the rest of the world, and uh, and I think everyone and everyone is in this together. And what we are seeing is that indeed that is the case. We are all in this together, and that's our commitment to you that we will continue to work together. And uh, and it's great to have someone like Lloyd because um, you know because uh, you know Lloyd sort of is able to sort of you know catch a giant net to you know bring in a lot of you know, a lot of commentary and that, that I have found has worked really, really well. Um, but again, look, I mean, if you have different ideas, then just let them know. Oh, sorry, Minister, you're frozen on my screen a little bit there. I missed the last 30 seconds of your, uh, of what you just said. Oh, what I, what I last said was if you have, or solutions for us to do it a little differently then feel free to let us know it's great for uh, you know it's great um, you know working with Lloyd I think you've got uh, you know just an incredible person to uh, catch you know sort of many of the inputs and uh, and you know and and and, and you know and Lloyd will sort of add to it as well in a way that is helpful for us to kind of come up with you know with other solutions and so forth um, so just just stay in touch and let us know if we can do something differently I mean welcoming those suggestions. Great. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time this evening, Minister Ng, to speak with us to the Guelph Chamber members. Um, really appreciate that Lloyd was able to confirm this evening uh, altogether. Um, we will be in touch. There are lots of very creative and innovative mm -hmm. ideas, as you know. Thank you to, for you to you for everything you've been doing. We know you're an advocate of the business community, and uh, we'll be in touch. Have a great evening. Thank you so much, Akiba. Thanks. Before you run away, Mary, yeah. mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you for the late night calls. Um, <laughs> we have uh, we have calls at the end of every day. We have uh, conference calls that Mary is, Minister Ng is, is on every night, seven days a week. The concerns that we get from Guelph, we've been able to work on together. Uh, we've been working with finance and your department has been really good at getting me in touch with finance and working together especially when it comes to rent relief which i know we'll be talking about in the second half of this presentation yeah. uh, but thanks for always being open to getting input and giving us your your staff time always always thank you and i appreciate uh, all the work that you do uh, i couldn't do this without all of you so uh, so i appreciate that so thank you great thanks very much have an excellent evening yeah you too all right bye 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 thanks Great.
Lloyd, thank you for staying on. Um, and thank you again for um, having such a strong working relationship, of course, with Minister Ng and um, securing her time with us this evening. We appreciate that we were able to get the feedback we've heard um, synthesized and, and questioned to her. This is an excellent opportunity now to see if we can dive deeper into any of those uh, questions that we discussed and came up. I'm wondering if there's anything you'd like to say off the top. Well, I've seen the questions stacking up on the side. Uh, we'll try and get to those as, as much as we can. Um, I've also put my email signature in the, the webinar chat room um, to do direct one-on-one uh, -on -one discussions with people. It, what Minister Ng said is real. It's not fluffy political stuff. It's we need to adapt programs to a lot of different situations. Um, we are developing programs as we uh, as we get different nuances brought to us and um, normally we have months to develop programs but this uh, situation doesn't allow for months we have generally speaking hours and days to get these things put together and we know that um, you know the as we go through this rent checks keep piling up the expenses keep piling up uh, and so working with the financial institutes and with landlords through those financial institutes is something that we're doing but let's turn it back over to you, Shakiba. And sure. uh, I want to hear as much as I can. I, I will try and keep my answers as short as I can uh, so we can get as many questions in as we can. But also, if I'm not getting all the details, please, uh, anybody that's on the line and anybody you know, uh, reach out to me. Great, thank you, Lloyd. So the most pressing comments we're seeing, of course, it has um, everything to do with eligibility criteria as it relates to all of the programs. Um, this evening, we're seeing a lot about the um, the, the loan, this uh, CEBA, and uh, the fact that businesses with uh, one or fewer employees or payroll amounts and, and such that don't match the criteria are falling through the cracks. Can you speak to that specifically? Yeah, I think it's one of the two issues that we still have to deal with. Um, the sole proprietorship support uh, is something that is more complicated than if you already are, are, are remitting um, uh, the uh, employment insurance deductions and the CPP deductions, uh, where we already know you through that tax stream. Um, personal bank accounts being used for business purposes is a challenge, but it's something that the finance minister has said to us that we are going to have a solution. We had a, a conference call with him with the Ontario uh, caucus executive that I sit on uh, last Thursday. Um, that uh, issue, uh, the CBA, um, a modified CBA for, for sole proprietors um, is something that we put as one of the top two priorities, the second one being getting some solution on the uh, on the rent relief for tenants and given again that we have to go through the landlords to get to the tenants because of our jurisdiction uh, going through mortgages and if they don't have a mortgage setting up a financial vehicle through CMHC that they could create a mortgage just so that we can pass money through it is what we're currently working on and hope to have that launched for next week. That's great. And the one other comment just related to this, just to leave with you, Lloyd, is related to the idea that um, many businesses use subcontractors. And right now that's not, I believe, considered a payroll expense. So just keeping that in mind as well. That's right. And the subcontractors themselves, uh, I'll, I'll back up a half a step and only for, for a very short uh, background. The CEBA was designed uh, for employment insurance for people that wouldn't normally qualify for employment insurance, which includes contractors, it includes self-employed people. And um, in order to get employment insurance into the hands of people that don't normally qualify, CBA was, was, was first created. Uh, and now what we're looking at is the um, reaching into sole proprietorships differently because you don't have payrolls. Um, they don't meet the $20,000 requirement. And uh, that requirement was put in, um, I, I guess I shouldn't, I don't have a lot of time to go into it, but we put it in as a filter to show that that class of business um, is more than just a, a one person and that they're an active business, that they're actually doing business as a plumber or they're, they're doing business as a, as, a, as, as a small business that has one part-time person and one part-time person at minimum wage comes out to $20,000. 
Right on. Okay, thank you, Lloyd. Uh, we look forward to uh, hearing more details as they develop and I appreciate, I know that you are uh, listening to us as we uh, update you daily on, on the difficulties our members are facing um, navigating that criteria. So we look forward to seeing uh, some, some improvement there. I'm going to pivot just a little bit. Um, I, I want to mention that the Chamber is uh, thinking very uh, significantly about how to support our members to in, ensure that they are able to support their employees and their community safety, of course. Um, we think of many of our uh, businesses who are in high-risk uh, businesses like long-term care or senior care and or manufacturers on lines. Um, we at the Chamber will have webinars and resources in place to support them uh, as guides and, and uh, feedback comes through public health. But I'm wondering uh, what else should, be, should we consider as, as a Chamber to support our members, but also what can we do to uh, see some federal government support and investment to either keep PPE costs low or perhaps um, provide tax credits or incentives to ensure that safety is maintained? That is a, that's a current discussion. We had a, a meeting last night uh, with our entire caucus and the Prime Minister and uh, talked about that way of doing some type of bulk purchasing, maybe using the numbers through public health. Uh, locally, I'd like to see us have a central place where we could have a clearinghouse for a product that has been qualified by Health, by health Canada. We have to make sure that whatever we're providing is something that will keep people safe. Um, and then the bulk purchasing of that going through some type of centralized system. So FedDev has a recovery stream. And I'm hoping that the Chamber of Commerce, uh, possibly the Downtown Business Association, um, groups where groups of businesses get together can access funds through FedDev. And there is a stream through FedDev for recovery funding. And that's where I would like to start directing the chamber. That link hasn't come up yet, uh, but that link will be there for additional cleaning, for um, putting up dividers in businesses, for helping isolate people uh, from each other, and then working with the chamber membership so that we can keep the business local as much as we can. So we have companies that have developed testing equipment that's just going through qualification. We have companies that are doing work around dividers, uh, face shields, uh, Linamar is doing ventilators, but they're also doing, um, they're doing work around other PPE equipment. We've got uh, seamstresses, or seam, or sewing businesses that are putting together um, cloth masks. So how do we get all these businesses working together at a central spot? It would be great to see the chamber participating in that. Certainly, that coordination is key and, and we are a part of those conversations. Thanks, Lloyd. Um, now, a specific example um, related to uh, PPE um, is in our Q&A here. Mm -hmm. uh, someone who owns a furniture business, um, similar to many products and services, it's obviously uh, more successful of a sale if someone's able to come through, touch, feel, sit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Curious, uh, you know, what kind of, you know, is that being considered as we move forward, the ability to move past just curbside and uh, create safe practices for, um, you know, that type of handling of product. It's, it's the discussion that we have is, is as I just indicated, what, what's the health standard for Canada? And then the province is the one that will decide how, how does the Department of Labor uh, qualify businesses to meet the standards that we set nationally. And that'll be different for different businesses. And so a furniture business, yeah. curbside pickup is pretty hard when you're trying to get a couch out the front door for every customer. Uh, so obviously there's gonna be have some other regulations on that that will come through the province. Um, so an example this week, uh, Toyota was going to open up in Cambridge. Uh, the provincial uh, department of labor went through the plant and delayed the startup of some parts of the plant that didn't meet the Ontario health standards for, for business. Um, so we, we're working very closely with the province. The strategy of who opens when, how they open, comes up from the province. And then it's up to us then to provide the programs through Health Canada to give the standards and the availability of equipment. Okay, great. Um, now on uh, that note, you just made a comment about um, jurisdiction, of course, around uh, federal and provincial. 
I'm wondering what can be done to see better coordination and co-investment between the federal and provincial governments. It's hard, of course, on the business end to see that being the difficulty uh, at being successful. I'm curious if, what, if you can set that context a little bit for folks that are listening and, and to let us know if there's anything we can do to uh, help uh, boost that. Yeah, well, First of all, I'll start by saying that Mike Schreiner and Cam Guthrie and I have a standing meeting every Tuesday morning and we deal with the issues of jurisdiction and we coordinate between us of what do we need from each other. Um, Mike is very aware that the rent and landlord, commercial uh, rent and landlord uh, situation is has to be fixed. The funding for that in British Columbia has a direct $500 going to every tenant the province of Ontario hasn't come forward with money for, for that situation. So Cam, I mean, Mike is going to be pushing for that. Um, wherever we have federal, provincial, municipal agreements on, let's say, infrastructure investment, which involves our construction industry, uh, we have priorities in Guelph that have, been, that have been approved federally and as a city, and now some of them with the province. So wherever we're sharing costs, it's, it has been frustrating for a couple of years now to get the province to the table because they're, they're trying not to spend money. Um, but some of these agreements we have would require them to be a co-investor. Uh, so 60 cents of the dollar coming from the federal government, um, 30 cents on the dollar coming from the provincial and 10 cents from the municipal is kind of one of the, one of the formula, formulas. Uh, we need that piece to be there. What we're doing in some cases is we're saying, okay, it's just too important. We will go in with our own money as a federal government uh, because we have to get that going forward. And so we've done that with some of the, some of the, some of the programs that we've, we've launched lately, the CERB or whatever else. Uh, we're working with FCM as well um, to get some infrastructure money into communities. Uh, but we do all have to work together and we really don't need politicians fighting politicians when we're in the middle of a pandemic. So I don't wanna go down that road. It's just your advocacy for whatever comes from the province and to help be a voice at the table through the Ontario Chamber and your own work uh, is really helpful for us as a federal government that's also trying to get things for Guelph. I appreciate uh, you answering that question. I know it can, it's a difficult one. And we will, like you said, as a chamber, not only continue to advocate to the federal government and the, uh, the federal um, government being liberals, um, but of course to our provincial government who are working very hard to do what they can also. Um, but we will continue to advocate there as well um, and ensure that that uh, cohesive collaborative um, effort is maintained and we are in it together. Yeah, like, and, and before we leave that, the province has done a great job of uh, public health. Uh, they have been very collaborative on policy. Um, the prime minister is on the phone right now, actually, uh, every Thursday evening, he's on the phone with all the premiers and uh, heads of territories. So we are all working together at the highest level. And then it's just a question of getting some of these priorities through the through the finances and, and we'll get there together. Great. That's good to hear. I have a couple of more questions. Um, it's, an, it's interesting to see so many of the questions posed are similar and we have captured most of them. Um, but I do appreciate, like you said, Lloyd, that folks can connect directly with your office and certainly obviously to, through to us as well because we communicate with you almost on a daily basis as well. So whatever is easiest for them. So the last two questions. The first perhaps is a quick one, and we've touched a little bit on this, but will the wage subsidy and other relief programs uh, like the loan, um, rent relief, will they be extended past the current dates that are sitting somewhere around mid to end of June? I mean, decisions will be made on that. Uh, the guidelines that the Prime Minister has had since the start is we will continue to do what we have to do and for as long as we have to do it that might translate differently for the tourism industry than it does for manufacturing. Um, the hotel industry in particular is a concern because they're not going to have events this summer. Uh, they're going to lose a lot of the revenue they normally get from hospitality uh, that they do, that they run events. And for Guelph, we've got several hotels that are in that position. Um, so how do we support the hotels throughout the next year? 
before the next series of events come through next spring, maybe. Uh, what's going to happen if the second wave hits, which is probably not an if, it's when the second wave hits, and how hard is it going to hit, depends on the steps that we're taking to distance and to make sure that we do a safe, safe recovery on the economy. Um, the federal government spending is one of the questions, and uh, can we afford to do everything we're doing? The, pub, the, the, the uh, parliamentary budget officer has said, you, we had about $58 billion in room. Um, speaking with the finance minister, uh, before all of this happened, he said, we have about $58 billion in room at the current levels of spending and, and, and the interest rates and where the economy was growing. So the 58 billion translates at current interest rates um, to we're less than 58 billion. We're still within the range of the parliamentary budget officer. We came in strong. We had a good balance sheet. Debt to GDP was strong. We think we'll recover quickly in some key areas, but we will have to keep investing in Canadians until we do get through it together. And it's not like people say that running a com country is like running a business and it's two very, very different things. Our horizon line is very different than a business's horizon line. And we have levers through the Bank of Canada, through international work we can do. Um, we think there's a huge economic opportunity for Canadians. If we get good at the recovery, we can help other countries. We're gonna have way too many ventilators in Canada. Other countries are gonna need them. So what are the export opportunities for IP, what on the testing equipment that we're developing? How could we uh, help other parts of the world economically uh, recover their countries if we can do the right, a good job ourselves? So we still have room to invest. We need to continue to invest until we don't need to do that anymore. Great. That's. Um helpful to hear um, of course you know on our end and what we're hearing from members is um, those timelines are hard to manage right and so for cash flow and projection purposes it's a difficult circumstance so that you know if that's just something I continue to leave you with um, and I know you know that of course um, but it is certainly uh, difficult uh, difficult for businesses right now and we talk about big numbers but it's the main street class business it's the person that's invested their, their savings in a business that now is struggling. First of all, we have to look after that person and we have to make sure that person can, can stay at home and buy groceries when they don't have an income stream. The second piece we have to work on is employees to make sure that they can be in place for when we recover. And so the wage subsidy program was to try and keep employees in place. The rent piece, keeping businesses in the same building is gonna help us in the recovery. And so we're not finished with that yet. And those are the things that I know keep people up at night. And I know it keeps me up at night because I know a lot of the businesses personally through my work with the chamber. I've had a lot of very, very tough phone calls with people that really don't know what their next step is going to be. So working with the banks to defer interest, working with the banks to defer charge cards, getting low interest loans into the hands of people. I'm currently working on BDC. Uh, their interest rate is too high uh, on the, 100% guaranteed loans from the Government of Canada don't require the higher service fees that they're charging. So we're still trying to get the service fee, I'm still trying to get service fees at BDC down so that people get liquidity so they can, if they can't get a deal with their landlord and they can't access other programs, they can go to their bank and through BDC get a loan that will take them through the cash flow and have 10 years to pay it back. If we can get that at the right interest rate, you'll still be around in 10 years to pay the loan back. So that was yesterday. I had several conversations with finance about that and they are working on it. So we'll see how that comes together. We can't afford to lose the businesses in Canada and we can't afford the people in Canada running those businesses to be left on the sidelines. So uh, we are doing everything we can and we are working every night, uh, seven, Seven days a week at 5.30, we have a standing conference call. So there's no time off until we get this thing done. I appreciate you saying that. And, um, and I know how hard um, all the folks in, in are working to, to try and support businesses. And we keep saying, and we know that businesses, obviously, um, you know, economic drivers are small businesses and then they're having a very hard time. And um, it's good to know that that's on, um, 
the radar and, and that we're going to continue to try and meet their needs and, and listen to them uh, when they say what works and what doesn't, uh, because we do need those businesses to stay open. You so one uh, one, more, th one yeah. more thing, sorry, Shakib, I no, keep doing this to you. But I mean, some of your members are banks and credit unions. Yes. And um, if, if, if they're having problems accessing or understanding the programs, I know that their institutes are pushing out programs and they're working out of their homes and they've got a lot of clients calling them. And um, if there's a question that maybe one of your members has gone to the bank and didn't get the answer they were hoping for, mm -hmm. I can't get into the bank and, and, and get into the arguments, but I can make sure the bank knows that the access to that program is a federally guaranteed loan. It's under this program. Um, so if people are having trouble at the banks, they can also contact my office and um, I can give them the links to the federal programs through the banks. And there are a ton of programs through the banks and there's more coming. Uh, the, that's one of the vehicles that we can use as a federal government is we, we control the Bank Act. So we gave the banks uh, different rules to lend money so that they don't have to have the same thresholds as they, ha they have legislated before or regulated before. So we've loosened regulations on access to credit. And I know people don't wanna go into further debt but at some point on a short term bridge might be the way that you have to do it to get out as long as you get 10 years to pay it back. Or if you pay it back in two years, you get 25% loan forgiveness. Those are the tools we're trying to use to say to people, this isn't your normal loan and it's not a normal time. You need money for three months. We need a longer period to pay it back out of your profits once you start up again and get profits. Um, and we need to be flexible in those programs. So the bank, the banks have been given some very unusual tools that um, some bankers are not used to either. It's like, I'm not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, actually you are because that rule has changed. And we've passed five bills in the last five weeks. And in the previous, previous parliament, which was normal, uh, it took 369 days to get a bill through parliament. And we've just got five bills done in five weeks. So we are changing the rules to try and help people get through. And I really want to do everything we can to support you and your members, and especially the ones that are having the sleepless nights right now. Thanks, Lloyd. And, and actually, it's a, a good um, a way to end the conversation, which is to note to everybody who's listening that they sh if they're struggling with something or they have a question that they feel like isn't being answered um, or receiving the help they think they should be getting to please contact um, our, our members of parliament our mpp our, our mayor um, but or just call us um, email us at the at the chamber all of our staff are here to support you um, and to get those uh, questions that you have that are important answered so if you're not sure please do contact us Thank you, Lloyd, for joining us this evening. We really always appreciate your insight and dedication to our members at the Chamber. I want to remind everyone on the call that our COVID-19 business support page is um, updated regularly. Every day we continue to post government updates. We post business support services, member deals, and other helpful tips. We also have lots of virtual events occurring each week, uh, important ones, helpful ones. So please take a look at our calendar at guelphchamber.com for that information. Thank you all for joining as we are pleased uh, uh, to, to be providing this kind of content to you and do reach out to us if we can support you in any way. Have an excellent evening. Thanks for Thank you, good night.